他们都习惯教我们进城，小铁路挖金矿做苦力，当劳工忍受着病痛。想念的金沙唱，如今好像在听他唱着那首熟悉的歌，离不开沙浪，竟然传进此时的 China Town。紫禁城没有了天赐，天使岛也没有了天使。多少人在这里坚持，又有多少人在这里冤死？面对着压迫、恐惧、惊慌，再多的苦难也都理所应当。在遥远的异乡，冷若冰霜，期盼万里长城的固若金汤，有可能信誓旦旦。也有可能失去判断，有的人打伤了自己的命，有的人吃碗里剩下的饭，都能够看见那一片的长蛇阵。身处在海外的亡国恨，忍受着充满着歧视的目光。还 Good afternoon.、Uh, my name is Eric Hong. I'm a programmer and a grant writer for the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, and we're very happy to、uh, present a new resource for Asian American media、uh, this afternoon. Uh, for the past four or five years,、uh, PATH has regularly done panels and actions、uh, to help、uh, Asian American Studies programs or help students who are fighting for、uh, Asian American Studies programs in、uh, at their undergraduate institutions. And we were trying to brainstorm how to do that this year when people are simply not on campus,、uh, and we were sort of stuck. So we. Uh, we decided that we want to do something different.、Uh, one of the issues when、uh, students fight for Asian American Studies programs is that they really only have a very small amount of time to do this fighting, and also that they are fighting for changes that will happen after they graduate.、Uh, and this is because a very few students go into university. Knowing what Asian American Studies is, so what we want to do with this resource and other resources that we will create、um, in the next, you know, several months,、uh, is to produce resources that will allow、uh, high school students、uh, and lifelong learners or first year students to learn Asian American Studies and make Asian American history, Asian American experience on their own. So our hope is that we can produce a resource that、uh, would help you、uh, teach yourself Asian American history in a fun way, and in this particular case, through film. So let me just introduce the resource. So it is called Asian Americans on Celluloid. Uh, this is a timeline which is created using Visme, and、uh, I can send you the embed code, and you can put it on any website you like. So you can see that、uh, there are short essays、uh, about, you know, general periods, and then、uh, guides for twenty films.、Uh, we decided that we will go with twenty films、uh, because we want this to be usable.、Um, One of the issues is that there there are plenty of resources with like reading lists of like fifty books, and the reality is that nobody has time to read fifty books, right? So we want to have something that you can actually do in your spare time,、um, and that uh, you can um, yeah you can learn at your own pace in your spare time. So all the films that are picked for this list. Uh, are of, are accessible. They are available for streaming for five dollars or less. So you might actually have you know you're not going to spend forty dollars trying trying to get access to to these films. So、uh, these are accessible for five dollars or less.、Uh, and on the left side of this resource,、uh, you can see just people、uh, who were sort of older history of Asian American film.、Um, And the idea here is that、uh, history writing is often what Sarah Schulman calls the gentrification of the mind, and and what she means by that is that when history is written,、uh, very often people who are not mainstream get left out. So people don't know the names of a lot of very important、uh, Asian American actors, directors of.、Uh, Cinematographers, sound people、um, in the past, and here you can just have a bunch of important people, and、uh, you can click on them and learn about them、uh, as you like. 
So that is an introduction to this particular resource. Uh, I will now turn things over to Irene, uh, who helped me uh, brainstorm this idea. Honored to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored to be here um, with Eric Hong, as well as um, our panel volunteers, Susie Birnbaum, Lauren Eng, Mia Lee, Ron Chao Liu, um, Fei Ma, and I think we are now being joined by John Sopayamanant. Um, I am a, a programmer for the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, my first year um, on the team. And I'm also an assistant professor of media and communication um, at Muhlenberg College. And I teach a course on Asian American media. And I was really excited to get to collaborate on this project with Eric and um, the volunteers because um, when I teach Asian American media, I found that it was really, really hard um, to teach in one course, not just about the films and media works themselves, but I realized that I also had to teach the history of immigration and race in the US, um, and of course the history of Asian Americans in the US, uh, because um, Asian American history and immigration history and racial history is not largely taught of course, in US high schools, um, even US high schools with high Asian American student populations. So um, at uh, the small liberal arts college where I teach, it's quite possible that my course in Asian American media is the only Asian American studies course that a student might encounter their entire college career. So I had to kind of pack everything in and I wanted a resource that would uh, show the chronology of Asian American history uh, alongside the chronology of Asian American film and media. Um, and this resource remarkably does not exist. There are some great online timelines of Asian American history. Um, and there are some really helpful um, online available histories of specific media organizations, like the history of the Center for Asian American Media in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and there's a decent amount of resources documenting the explosion of uh, popular mainstream Asian American uh, media works, um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, I'm looking at you. Um, but there, but you know, I want students to know about um, a far longer history of Asian American participation in the history of not just Hollywood cinema, but also of independent ex experimental and art, uh, film, video, and media. Um, so I want students to know about uh, the films of Sesua Hayakawa, um, a Japanese American film star of the 1910s who ran his own film production company and famously was such a heartthrob um, that when he um, came out of his limo and had to, um, and there was a mud puddle before him on the street, women would throw their mink coats on the ground before him so that his feet would not have to touch the mud. Um, I want students to know about Anna Mae Wong who left the US um, in 1935 when she lost the main role in the film ad adaptation of Pearl Buck's novel about China, The Good Earth, to a white actress who performed the role in Yellowface. And I want students to know about Robert Nakamura who co-founded Visual Communications, the oldest community-based Asian Pacific American Media Arts Organization in the United States in 1970 with Alan Ohashi, Eddie Wong, and Duane Kubo. So these are the um, media and film histories alongside the longer immigration um, and um, cultural history of Asian Americans uh, that don't necessarily show up in the um, certainly important to celebrate contemporary um, Asian American media uh, it, uh, representation in popular culture. Um, but I hope that this resource is an accessible introduction to um, those two chronologies. Um, I think next up, uh, I would love for, or we would love for all of the um, panel volunteers who contributed to uh, this online resource, um, to introduce yourselves and tell us about um, what you learned in the process of researching the films that you contributed to the resource. 
Um, shall we start with Faye? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Faye. Um, I just graduated from Swarthmore College a few months ago, was a major in Asian studies and minor in music. So I do ethnomusicology and mostly on Sinophone world and Chinese diaspora. And um, the two film entries that I created were for um, The Curse of Guang Gong and Saving Face. And um, The Curse of Guang Gong, which is a 1917 um, silent film written and um, directed, produced by Marin Wong, um, is a story of a Chinese American couple clashing with very traditionalist family. And um, there are two things that I found you know, pretty remarkable about this film. First of all, is this notion of a kind of a folk religion system and these Chinese deities traveling with these people, with this diaspora, which is a trope that is very common and well studied in Afro-Atlantic and Afro-Caribbean religions, which I think definitely deserve more scholarly attention in the Asian American context. And then um, the second thing is that this film provides a uh, perspective into a trans-Pacific resonances of the 1911 revolution in China, which end the 2000 years of imperial rule, um, an event that is usually studied only within the Chinese or Asian context. Um, and then the second film I wrote about Saving Face is a 20, I mean, 2004 um, lesbian rom-com set in New York. And it has this dual storyline of a young Chinese American lesbian coming out to her mother and her Chinese community. And then her mother, this woman, Chinese American woman in her 50s, kind of chasing her true love for the first time in her life. Um, one thing that I found pretty interesting about this film is that it is a very transnational production. Um, most of the um, actors in the cast are either um, actors from mainland China or Hong Kong, Taiwan, who has established a career in the United States or um, Chinese American actors who later um, you know, started being active in Asia. And I think this phenomena is largely due to you know, a lack of a robust market for Asian American content. Um, at the time. And, you know, these actors have to code switch not only between two languages, but also to industries, to careers, the cultures of these different industries and different aesthetics. Um, you know, I think that's quite remarkable and again, deserve more attention. Um, so yeah, and then one common theme I found between these two films that are made almost a hundred years apart from each other is that they both deal with uh, marriage, love, and especially kind of female virtues um, that are tugged between two value systems, which I think is still very relevant to this day. And that is it for me. Great, thank you so much, Faye. Um, how about we hear from um, Ran Chao next? Hello all, thank you Faye for sharing your thoughts on the films and thank you Eric and Erin for putting together this panel and for making this happen. Um, I also wrote on two films, uh, The Banning Banquet, The Wedding Banquet and The Who Killed Vincent Chain. Um, so when I was uh, writing on these two films, the first thing that I realized was that I am so grateful that I picked this combination because one is a comedy, romantic comedy, and the other one is a documentary film about, um, honestly, a hate crime murder. So um, I've seen both films really a long time ago, so I got to rewatch them to write the materials. Um, what was really triggering when rewatching Who Killed Vincent Chang and doing the research on this case, um, especially in the current juncture, is that um, it's not only because it really happened and that the murderer didn't serve any prison time or ever paid the fence out to the Chang's family, um, what is also triggering is that something like this that happened in 1982 can still easily happen today. Um, especially with the renewed anti-Asian sentiment after the COVID-19 pandemic started. Um, but really not just to Asians, but to all Blacks, Indigenous people and people of color. And so after writing on Who Killed Vincent Chang, I was kind of grateful that I got to write about the wedding banquet because um, all things considered, the movie has a happy ending. Um, 
Also, um, I have to rewatch it and rewatching The Wedding Banquet, this 1993 film was really interesting um, to me because it reminded me how important the film was and still is to the LGBTQ Asian community, um, both in Asia and in the US due to its highly transnational production background and its bilingual content and cross-cultural dialogues throughout the film. Um, I watched it the first time I watched it when I was a teenager and I was still living in mainland China and I'm also a queer person. So at the time, you know, as a teenager, I was exploring my own sexuality. And as you know, I was watching a lot of quote unquote Western shows about LGBTQ relationships because um, I needed to see my own people. Um, but because of the huge lack of representation of queer Asians, films like The, the Wedding Banquet and Saving Face as well were so important to folks like me. Um, it is so important, meaningful to see the comp uh, complex nature of our struggles being explored and presented publicly and with acceptance and an open mind. So the film is an important reminder of all those things and things that we still need. Great, thank you so much, Ren Chao. Um, next, could we hear from Susie? Hi everyone, I'm Susie. I was actually a former student uh, at Muhlenberg and Irene and I did research together on trans racial um, Asian adoption films. Um, and the two films that I watched, uh, one is called Unfinished Business um, from 1985 and the other one is called AKA Don Bonus from 1995. And both of them are documentaries. Um, Unfinished Business is much more of a classic documentary where um, you know, there are formal interviews and then there um, our flashbacks to uh, archival footage of the Japanese internment. Um, and then AK Don Bonus is much more of a vlog style, an early um, vlogging style of this uh, sort of teenager who's in San Francisco living in the projects. And he and his entire family came from Cambodia as refugees to the US. And it's sort of a slice of life, um, but it's also like a personal video diary. And I didn't expect them to have any connection, but I think what I love about both of them is that they let the footage speak for themselves. They're not trying to make, I guess Unfinished Business is trying to make a bigger purpose about the story of these three, um, three particular men who um, at the time in the early 1980s are fighting these legal cases to get reparations, but also like legal um, acknowledgement from the US government of what they did um, in taking away their rights. But I think both of them really struck me in just the fact that the raw footage takes you there. You don't, you know, you can read about it in a book or you can hear about it in um, a lecture, but it's not trying to make a bigger point beyond just the lives that people are living or the lives that they did leave um, as they were interned. And I think the significance is that you can't ignore it. You know, I was lucky enough in high school to have a little bit of exposure to the concept of Japanese internment um, in the West. Um, and we read a book, but it really just didn't do anything for me. But seeing the footage of these families coming off of trains and then these like really shoddy barracks that were made for them, it, you know, it's something that you can't unsee and it's something that you can't take away from people. So um, that's what I found for both of them was just the actual footage of people's lives says more sometimes. Great, thank you so much, Susie. Um, next, uh, could we hear from Mia? Well, um, I watched uh, Chen is Missing, and um, it was a featured film. And uh, uh, the, uh, there are a lot of interesting points related to this, uh, this film. But uh, most of all, uh, I want to focus on irony. And uh, the irony really goes through the entire film from the beginning to end. and. There are uh, a few things are characterized for that matter. And the first the characters. So Chen is Missing really manifests what it is about this film and the, the, the storyline of this film. 
And the main characters are um, uh, two people, and Joe and Steve. And uh, uh, they're American-born Chinese, and and they they they're like average average uh, Chinese Americans living in uh, Chinatown, San Francisco. So uh, the uh, the reason that Joe and Steve are main characters uh, is that. Uh, they uh, they gave uh, money to Chen uh, for their business purposes, but Chen disappears. So they they ch started chasing after uh, uh, where Chen is and try to find uh, Chen to to get their money back. But the the character is really interesting. It's uh, um, Joe is uh, uncle uh, um, and Steve is nephew, and so their age gap is pretty big and. Um, and Joe is more calm, and Steve is more like a really uh, energetic or hot-tempered. And so it's a, it seems like a stereotypical, but in fact, and um, Joe is always uh, more open, very open-minded, and uh, he perceives the way it is, and Steve uh, isn't. He's so much younger. However, his mindset is so closed, and uh, he only sees what he thinks he sees. So it's kind of a you know, the older person is supposed to have, we normally think that that uh, uh, they already, their mindset is already closed in, they, their identity is so strong and, and they're, they're not gonna change, but it's completely reversed. And Steve is a young Steve has that kind of mindset, but Joe doesn't. Joe has a very openness uh, about seeing things differently. And then there's another thing that, uh, that shows irony that, that is a, a food, a theme of food. It's so from the beginning to end, there's a Chinese cooking scene, just nonstop flowing and through the movie. And uh, it's very funny that in fact, that Chinese people don't really think Chinese food is Chinese food because a lot of uh, Chinese immigrants and who uh, cook these Chinese food or uh, at, at a restaurant, especially, and they cook, Chinese American food. So <laughs> to them, that's not authentic Chinese food. So to them, and, and it, this Chinese food is just the kind of food they developed to fulfill or satisfy American taste. So there's like a kind of re really weird irony to it. And uh, uh, for Americans, uh, Chinese food is Chinese food, and especially they go to Chinatown and to find a uh, good Chinese food. But uh, for these Chinese people, Chinese immigrants who make these Chinese food, it, it's not really Chinese food. And then the third thing is the language. Language is just, uh, it, it gets really funny. And uh, uh, so there the social worker comes in and try to uh, try to find Chen too. So Joe and Steve and asked him, why are you trying to find, find, uh, uh, find Chen? And he says, well, uh, Chen got into car accident. He, he's some guy, and the uh, police got involved. And police asked him simple question: Did you stop at the stop sign and hit this guy? And Chen and and uh, he's a Chinese immigrant, and and try to uh, answer this as correct as possible, which means he's gonna explain the whole circumstances. There's no way he can just say yes or no. So he's trying to explain whole, the whole circumstances and, and it makes uh, police really angry. And so policemen just want yes or no, just answer yes or no. But he's like, oh, okay, you want correct answer. I'm gonna give you whole circumstances. So uh, so this is this language barriers and also misunderstanding the opposite side of language it really kind of shows us some kind of irony. And and uh, the fourth thing is, um, is this is my take. and. Is a title. It's, it's a title itself is very straightforward. Chen is missing. Chen is missing. So, well, well, what does that matter? And Chen is missing. Well, Chen Chen is not an important person, right? And so, um, but the, what's important is that uh, the implication of uh, the, uh, the the Chen when, after Chen is mi missing. It's a uh, uh, well. He, he took money and uh, he disappeared. So the money has to be found. So in the end, and the money is returned. And so it, it movie literally gives you answer. But the thing is, the movie itself is not about money. 
it is all about the complication of uh, Chinese Americans' lives. And uh, it's, uh, and then, so it, it has, it, 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 ha it gives you this, this really weird irony that Chinese missing and Chinese left, but the movie is all about uh, Chinese Americans' lives who are living and staying in America. So that was my take. It was a little long, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but I thought that was interesting, irony. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mia. Um, and uh, next, uh, Lauren, could you uh, unmute, introduce yourself and tell us about your film? Hey. Hi all, my name is Lauren and I am a student at University of Maryland College Park and I'm studying information studies with minors in Asian American studies and sustainability studies. So I watched Documented, which was a really informative documentary that followed Jose Antonio Vargas, who came to the United States at the age of 12 from Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. And this was a very abrupt journey for him that was entirely planned by his grandfather. He ended up living the rest of his life in the United States, and he was raised by his grandparents. So Vargas didn't actually know that he was undocumented until he tried to apply for a driver's license as a teenager. And then an employee told him that his ID was fake. And before watching this film, I also hadn't known very much about the whole immigration and citizenship process. And I learned that it was a decades long movement. So in 2001, the DREAM Act was introduced in the United States Senate. This legislation proposed a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, because surprisingly, there isn't an actual procedure for them to do that, which Vargas uh, repeatedly mentioned throughout the documentary. And then introducing this bill sparked a whole movement led by a generation of young, undocumented immigrants called the Dreamers. And although this bill didn't pass the Senate, in 2012, Dreamers became eligible to apply for work permits and deferred action, which is a status the executive branch can grant to undocumented immigrants that delays their deportation. But still today, um, most undocumented immigrants don't have a path to legal status no matter how long they've been in the United States. Critics say that they should just, quote, get in line, and someone in the documentary actually told Vargas to do the same, but he explained to them that there actually is no line for current undocumented immigrants. The regular channels such as employment and um, family reunification and humanitarian reasons are pretty much largely unavailable for prospective immigrants who are already in the United States. The documentary raised another interesting point too. So when we talk about the whole issue of immigration, immigrants often become this faceless, nameless group that's really up to debate rather than actual humans who have hopes and dreams and futures. And in the United States, we also tend to immediately think of Mexican immigrants and the southern border. So the documentary spoke to how undocumented immigrants aren't just from Mexico. There's actually estimated to be over 1.3 million undocumented immigrants from Asia alone in the United States. And these are people like Vargas who really just want to live normal lives. So this man, he's Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He's an Emmy-nominated filmmaker, and he's a Tony-nominated producer, and he really stresses that he, like others, just want to contribute to this country. And this is emphasized throughout the whole documentary. It was very powerful. And the timeline has additional readings and resources on this subject as well. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and then uh, let's hear from our final uh, 
panel volunteer. Um, John, could you unmute, introduce yourself, and tell us about your films? Hi, I'm John uh, Silapai Amanan, and um, I'm a musician, actually. And uh, But I do have a, a, a long interest in Asian and Asian American films. Uh, so uh, most of my work, though, is, is actually in uh, immigrant music. So, um, but the two films that I watched were Montauk Eulogy by um, Marlon Fuentes and uh, Manzanar by Robert Nakamura. And with, um, I had I'd never seen either of these films uh, and I've only, I'd only heard of Nakamura before, um, but I, I really found Montauk Eulogy incredibly interesting uh, for, for uh, many, many different reasons. And I think one of those is that the, the history of uh, Southeast Asian Americans isn't as well known as that of uh, South and especially East Asians, um, but especially Filipino Americans, because that's, they have a very interesting status because of course, during the early part of the 20th century, they, they, were, they were a colony, so they weren't technically immigrants. They were allowed in the country, but then things changed and then <laughs> All of a sudden, their status was taken away, and they became yeah. Um, uh, they had a different status once the uh, once the the colonies were turned back over to their rule. So um, this, of course, the the film itself. Ta um, Marlon talks about himself as a child, and and has, has talks about his early childhood memories, and then relates them to um his experience and and his children here growing up in the states and not having that history of of the the homeland and he especially goes into uh trying to find where his two grandfathers uh, what happened to his two grandfathers that he never grew up knowing because they were uh, both mysteriously disappeared and um the the majority of the film focuses on uh one of the grandfathers who uh, did actually come to the States, but came to the States uh, to become a part of the, the St. Louis World Fair. And I think that's another part of American history we don't really uh, uh, don't really appreciate because we don't seem, uh, there's this whole sense that we bring all these cultures to the U.S. to present them to the U.S., but at the same time, this was sort of at the tail end of what uh, we know was happening during the 19th century of human zoos, where we'd have humans on exhibition and tour them around the world. And this was definitely tied to that. Uh, and so these, these Filipinos who were brought in were basically forced to uh, build their own, build a village and live there on display for all the uh, white Americans to, to watch and see. And this happened to many, many different cultures, of course. And so the, the, the film itself is interesting because it's, it's not um, entirely factual. It's, 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 it's loosely based on his life, uh, the, the filmmaker's life. And, but it, it's, it's more suggestive of the types of experiences that a lot of um, Filipino American uh, immigrants may have, especially those who have had family that may have come to the US earlier through uh, these world fairs uh, events. So there's that, and the uh, the second film I watched, uh, Manzanar, was actually very was very very short. I was <laughs> I kept thinking, okay, there must be more to this because I I, I kept seeing 16 minute clips, and I, no, that was the, that was a full event. And so I finally read up on it before watching it, and said, okay, this is a film uh, a film that he had done during his uh, stay at the UCLA uh, Film School. And it's another part of American history. It's about another part of American history. Uh, I think more of us know about now, um, but the Japanese American internment. And but it, it, this one's very, very uh, almost um, almost impressionistic. There's there's a lot of imagery, uh, a lot of it footage that he was taking with. You can obviously tell it's a ca uh, handheld cam because the footage is very shaky. Um, and then it's it's interspersed with actual images of the Japanese Americans who were um, in in some of the camps, and some uh, and then some clips of some of the, the propaganda films that were used by the U.S. during the time. And then there are three short monologues that he has scattered throughout just of his 
impressions and feelings uh, from when he was actually in uh, camp. And he was there from uh, the ages of five to seven. And as, as most, most of us know, we don't remember too many things from when, from when we were young, but he, he definitely brought out those three uh, instances. And they were, they were very poignant and, and interesting because they weren't necessarily the type of horrible things we would expect from an internment camp. But I think children, of course, approach um, experiences like that differently than, than adults do and process it differently and may remember it differently after the fact. So, um, but I, I thought that was an interesting film because I hadn't realized there was one so early because this, that one was in 1972 uh, that had actually done, uh, documented the Japanese American internment. And um, so I, I think it's one of the one of the earliest, and I think it's important in that respect because it's it's good to know that uh, we have some documentation of some of those experiences because that generation is is dying off now, and we need to learn as much as we can from them before they're gone. So, um, so yeah, the, the, those were the two films that I watched, and I'm looking forward to seeing more. Thank you very much to, to everybody, uh, and thank you for your great work. Uh, for those who are following along uh, on your own, um, we don't, uh, as you can see, the, the timeline isn't completely done. Uh, it will be in the next week, uh, but uh, it will be usable very, very soon. Uh, we just have a few things to, to fill out. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the state of uh, Asian American studies a little bit. When did each of you, or you know, we, maybe given so many people, maybe two, two people would answer each question, or maybe at the most three, um, when did you become interested in studying Asian American history and experience, and what led you to, to that? Um, anyone can please jump in. For me, entering college, I joined a lot of um, Asian American organizations because growing up, I don't feel that I had a lot of access to it. And I think that through forming friendships and connections and bonding with people, it just got me a lot more interested in Asian American culture and then ultimately Asian American studies. And I think that that was a really important step for me. Yeah, for me, like I'm an international student from China and I came to the US for college. So for me, this kind of initiation into the American racial politics or like racial structure happened at the same time as I embarked on my like intellectual, like academic journey, which made it almost like natural for me to learn about this history at the same time of experiencing it myself and, you know, making sense of the things that are like I was going through um, both on a intellectual level and at the, you know, like personal emotional level. So it felt very um, natural and necessary for me, I guess, to get into this right. history. So uh, for, for those who are recent students or current students, um, what does your university currently offer uh, and what do you wish it offers? Um, I can answer this one too, because I just graduated from Swarthmore College. We do not have Asian American studies program or department. I think we are uh, starting to form one with the TRICO. So Swarthmore, Haverford, Brimmore, the TRICO um, consortium. And it's going to be like a program, not a department. So, you know, people from different departments who does work that are related to Asian studies, uh, Asian American studies, sorry, um, will be teaching on these subjects. And as um, so in, at Swarthmore, there are some English um, classes um, offered by the English department on Asian American literature, 
um, in the music department there, and then in the history department, likewise, I think in education department, there was once a student led class called Asian American studies that was situated in the education department. But I think the biggest problem still lies in on the structural, like the institutional level, because Asian studies for Asian American studies for now was lumped into Asian studies, which is insufficient and unfair to both. Um, and really, I think it you know manifests the the problem within the study too. Um, so yeah, I that's kind of a status quo at my institution. Susie, do you have thoughts? Oh, I did, and then I forgot the question. <laughs> Um, I, I I vaguely remember. Was it what what is Asian studies like at your university, yes. and then what would you like it to be like? Okay, cool. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. So I was a Asian, I guess, traditions minor. Although I keep writing Asian studies, so I think I should change that. But um, I know at Muhlenberg, um, it can only be in a, be a minor um, because there are a few classes. And then surprisingly, now that I think back to it, all of my classes revolved around. Like, ancient Asian studies, so like Chinese uh, anthropology and ancient Chinese philosophy. Um, I actually didn't get to take um, Asian American media with Irene. I just found her on my own. Um, and so I think it's it still sometimes is, I think the classes were stuck behind that lens of um, the ancient things and observing it like this otherworldly thing, which of course the history is important to know about, but also it was very, um, it wasn't American centered. So the experiences that I had in trying to understand Asian American things without taking Irene's class, I had to figure out on my own. Um, and I learned on my own with a research project. And so I just wish in general that the classes overlapped more between just, I don't know, English classes or, uh, <laughs> other humanities courses, they just integrated it more into their studies rather than Asian studies of Asia and then the one Asian American media class. Great, thank you. Uh, Irene has a question. Great, thank you so much for um, everyone's really great insights about the films that you researched. I feel like I'm looking at them in a really different way from hearing how you experience them. Um, and that leads me to a question that I would love to ask you about um, how the experience of watching the films that you uh, explored for this project um, in the kind of canon of Asian American um, filmmaking um, compared to the Asian representations that you see in everyday popular media. Um, if you could just maybe speak to, um, yeah, like th that experience of comparing. Um, and I'd love to hear from, let's see, who have we not heard from in this? round. Um, John, uh, Mia, and Ren Chao. Okay. Uh, oh, we're, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, um, of course, the one of my films didn't really even have um, <laughs> Technically, didn't have any uh, portrayal of, of Asians other than the the older documentary, uh, the propaganda documentary, and then the the photo images. So the only the only thing we heard was uh, 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 Rob, uh, Robert's voice during it. Um, but comparing it to some of the other Asian American films I've seen, of course, it's it's so much better for one <laughs> because uh, I think the uh, the issue is that it's it's not just that it has the representation, but also the directors are often Asian American, the writer, screenwriters, the the crew are often Asian American. So it, it's it's so much nicer to see a fully rounded character in these films that you don't find in most Hollywood Asian uh, Asian representation, which in some cases they're this, they're just there as um, an ex like exotic candy they're they're there sometimes they don't even have speaking roles sometimes they're they're just one-dimensional characters um and yeah they're just basically put in there to be a little bit of spice for the hollywood films um in most cases so sidekicks yeah. right 
Or a sidekick, yes. Yeah, <laughs> if, yeah never, never to lead. <laughs> Always a sidekick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Um, I'm gonna piggyback a little bit on <laughs> what John has said, and uh, I think he has a great point. Uh, but I think when you think about uh, Asian uh, characters, the way they are portrayed, and it's a sidekicks, right? I mean, what John said in in media and Hollywood movies and all that, but that's because all these main characters of Asians were played by white and <laughs> white people try to act like Asians. And that, uh, and that is a problem. A lot of whitewashing happening. And, uh, and then the, the, uh, so a lot of times, not just the Americans in general perceive Asians uh, can be played by white people and uh, Asians think that too. In many cases, Asians uh, assimilated themselves as one race, like uh, one specific race, as white uh, Caucasian race. And uh, uh, I think and that is a huge misconception. And the movie I watched, uh, Chan is Missing, it shows the, uh, the absolute complexity of uh, Chinese American uh, people, everyday Chinese American people, American born Chinese or uh, uh, Chinese immigrants, uh, they, they lead very, very different lives and complex lives and, and uh, uh, of their own. It's, it's not like uh, they're trying to assimilate white people or black people or in a, a Latin X. They, they are just very different, very authentic, and uh, they are just who they are. But what we see as as Americans, not just as an Asian, as whitewashed images in screen and in all sorts of medias, and that is the problem. I think. I think it's that we have this weird idea that Asians try to be white, and then that. They kind of reflect ourselves, and uh, uh, that we try to achieve a higher goal, whoever's on top, and we try to achieve. But that's false idea, as as I saw from um, uh, from this movie. They are very different. We are authentic. We are individual, and then there must be some kind of study that has to prove that Asian Americans are different, and there aren't enough studies to uh, see or to learn and to understand, to reflect and the authenticity of Asian Americans. And that is a huge problem as a, as a, as a country itself, as a culture, the, as an American itself. Um, and uh, I, I hope that, that people realize and there's a problem. And so the country would do, would do <laughs> the education uh, could be more uh, evolved and, and with all these different uh, types of studies, including uh, Asian American studies and, and, and grow uh, much bigger in depth in the future. I guess I, I'm just going to quickly add like one point. And first of all, I agree with what John and Mia said about like how we can see more well-rounded Asian characters in Asian-centered films and Asian American films or films that are produced by Asians or Asian Americans, for sure. Um, and also Erin's question makes me um, think that whenever we talk about, for example, Asian stereotypes, we usually we are usually talking about Asians in those non-Asian centered films, like Asians in Hollywood films and how we're being those, those one-sided characters and or sidekicks. Um, and that makes me wonder um, what more can Asian American films do uh, beyond presenting like more well-rounded uh, everyday life of Asian Americans. Um, yeah, and it's uh, the, the biggest difference for sure is that we get to see more aspects of uh, what it means to be Asian, what it means to be Asian in the US and what it means to have all those transnational connections with the homeland, et cetera. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to ask a, a couple different questions, but uh, 
Run Chow, I'm wondering what it is like to do uh, research on Asian Americans uh, in a communications department in the PhD program, which is, uh, I mean, do you get do you get the types of questions <laughs> from your colleagues that uh, that you need to to help you, or do they just, I mean, yeah, what? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so I am a, a PhD candidate in the communication communication department um, from University University of Minnesota right now. Um, we don't have any like Asian faculty members in my department. So in that aspect, I definitely don't have the direct men mentoring that I need. Um, but but what's good about, I guess, um, any student, for any student who, who are interested in like doing Asian American studies is that you can always reach out. And like what some of us have mentioned that you sometimes you need to find uh, the professors that you need mentoring from in other departments that are not necessarily Asian American studies department because they don't exist. Um, so um, yeah, so and in terms of questions, I, I guess I want to add one thing, um, which is that our department, communication department has um, like a a course offering that's about Asian American popular culture and communication, which is so rare uh, from an observation that is not commonly offered in a communication department. Um, yeah. So it's great. It's great to be able to reach out to people. And that's how I found out about Mark, like <laughs> uh, music. Uh, research center of Asian American music because I needed to reach out and meet more people. And that's also how, how like this resource is happening because uh, we are from different um, fields and uh, together we can make Asian American studies more uh, complex and more available to others. Great, thank you. So uh, we have an audience question. Uh, Casey, can you put that up please? So Amy Corbin writes, can uh, anyone talk about some up and coming independent filmmakers or media artists that you wish more people knew about? Um, I, I will let anyone want to jump in. Um, can I give a plug for a film that is actually available still for the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. It's Spider Moth Butterfly, a feature length film directed by um, Alexis Mo, um, which is a Spanish language um, film uh, about a circus troupe in Mexico um, that uh, leaps between um, filmmaking genre and um, theater and circus arts. Um, and is so visually striking um, and takes many unexpected um, and intense turns uh, while also being really a visually beautiful and arresting film that you should check out in the festival, Spider Moth Butterfly. Other recommendations? I have a couple. Um, uh, our opening film, PATH's opening film uh, two years ago, I think, uh, was In the Life of Music, uh, which was by uh, Kaylee So, which is, I think, really one of the more poignant themes, uh, films I've watched uh, in, in recent years. Um, and I would also put a plug into, uh, I think a really important film is uh, Down the Dark Stairwell which is about the Akai Gurley shooting, uh, which just came out this summer, so. I can also make two recommendations. Um, so first is um, an artist and a director filmmaker, Andrew Thomas Huang, and he does a lot of like visually beautiful and experimental works. Um, another one is a recent film called Yellow Rose, and it's about like it's a beautiful combination of music and immigrant life. So those are two recommendations that I want to share. Um, I also just love that uh, not only are you pointing to um, the range of diverse lived experiences that uh, and the stories that 
um, emerge in Asian American filmmaking, but also about the experimentation um, with form, um, visual, uh, sound, um, and with narrative form that I think uh, pushes the boundaries of filmmaking in really exciting ways and um, intersects filmmaking with activism, with art, um, with video, with television. Um, so uh, I just want to kind of also put out there that Asian, Amer I think that part of what uh, digging through Asian American history through Asian American film and video is about is, is a story of um, innovative aesthetic experimentation. So I, I want to give John an opportunity to talk a bit about what he's doing uh, to uh, remedy some of the issues that he talked about earlier and, and, and others talked about earlier. So uh, the floor is yours. Um, which which specific <laughs> issues are you wanting me to talk about? <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> um, well, a lot of the research that I, I'm doing is 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 basically uncovering a, 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 the hidden histories of of many different cultures that aren't the dominant cultures, and this is worldwide. And um, like what uh, one of my more more recent projects is actually exploring uh, slave orchestras, basically orchestras of slaves from the transatlantic and the transpacific and in the ocean slave. Uh, we in classical music uh, have this this kind of whitewashed history of of what classical music is, and yet we find that there were orchestras of Indonesian slaves that were playing baroque music in Indonesia and sometimes being toured around parts of Asia. Um, on, on the mainland and uh, in Southeast Asia and as far and, and uh, even parts of I, I believe Africa um, and so you know these these histories aren't aren't a part of the classical music curriculum or even a part of just our normal uh, uh, the normal uh, way we absorb you know when we learn about composers oh we learn as much as we can about the composer or uh, if, if someone teaches about uh, teaches us a new song we learn we they teach us, you know, the history or the background of the song. But there are all these these musicians, composers, uh, orchestras, ensembles um, that were enslaved, and in many cases, that they were Asians. And and uh, and obviously, of course, there's the the African slaves that were enslaved as well and made to play in orchestras. And it, it was basically a worldwide thing. And it's just so much a background uh, of the whole uh, Western imperialism and colonialism and and has shaped uh, a lot of how some of these musical cultures have, have evolved throughout the, well, centuries, because this is something that's happened, uh, took place over 300 years. So, um, so I think, I think bringing those stories to light is is very very important, and uh, of course it's very difficult too because uh, I'm having to read in languages. Well, I'm having to try to read or figure out a way to read in languages I don't know uh, from many different colonized countries, and because that's where most of the information is. It's uh, when we uh, in scholarship, most of the languages we learn uh, and and work with are European languages, especially in classical music, and so. We're not going to learn about the uh, the you know the Indonesian slaves or the slaves in in uh, Manila, the uh, slave orchestras in Manila, because you know those well, that's the Spanish. Span some of it's in Spanish, but not the Tagalog stuff uh, obviously is very different. Uh, it's just yeah, there's there's so many different barriers that exist, and I think they need to be broken down. And a part of that is just the types of structural issues we have with how. Western scholarship works and the narratives that it tells. And so I'd like to, I'm trying to help break that down. <laughs> Can you imagine a documentary on that? Oh, I know, I know. It's right. <laughs> I, so I actually any can. Filmmakers, uh, any filmmakers <laughs> out there, uh, here might be, here, here's a topic you can do. So we have uh, just a couple, uh, maybe a minute left. Um, final thoughts that uh, anyone wants to offer? Uh, Next steps you think we should take? See as many films in the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. I think that's a great place 
to start. Um, and these small festivals that uh, Asian American uh, volunteers um, put together um, in uh, media organizations in Philadelphia um, and other places, those are great places to explore and find other people who are also hungry for um, these types of representations that we don't necessarily see either in Hollywood mainstream or even in the um, in the art and independent cinema world. Great, so I think that is a wrap for us. Um, thank you so much, Brett, for doing the tech and KC for helping with uh, moderating. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you so much for adding to this resource and sharing your insights. You say this kill black and brown and when will you talk about class in this story? The rest is allegory. Come to Protection to what we gonna do, organize our way through. And for those behind bars, we must fight hard. Global pandemic, endemic, systemic, no equality, no quality of life.